I'm Matt and I work at Exceptional Individuals, a employment specialist for neurodivergent individuals in the UK, though we do support the whole world. And we deliver these webinars every single Thursday uh, to do people who are neurodivergent and people who are just curious to learn and trying to dive in deeper each time on subjects which you might not be familiar with or might not be that accessible to the everyday person, just like looking into legal aspects. Really important to know, but no one bothers teaching you this stuff. So that is why we are who we are. So know your rights, the Equality Act. This, I always, I have to do this at the last one, I have to do it again, just so you all know, I'm not a lawyer, please do not take anything I say too seriously, though I have extensively read the Equality Act, it is not my job to inform or advise, but what I can do is relay information that is easily accessible online. In places, what I have done is took quite complex subjects and I whittled it down to its bare bones, and as a result, there may be instances where the full meaning isn't always translated, but I have done my best to mitigate that as much as possible. But just be aware that today is about education, not about giving advice. And now I've saved myself from jail, let's do a little refresher on what we learned on the previous webinar. So the last one was focused on the Equality Act, and today is going to be going a bit deeper even more on equality and what, what types of discrimination are there. Because a lot of the time you think there's only one type of discrimination, there's a few. But to refresh, neurodivergent under the Equality Act is likely covered. Likely? What do you mean by likely? Well, it's not actually written in it. However, there are many, many tribunals, these are like cases, which have gone through about dyslexia, about autism, around dyspraxia. So it's very likely covered, but not explicitly mentioned in the 2010 Equality Act. I know, the more you know. Essentially, a disability is anything which is anything which is affecting your day-to-day -day life more than minor, so in a more severe to moderate level for 12 months or more. So it's a, it's a big definition. And under that, for instance, dyslexia or autism would come under. It's something which you have for lifelong and it does affect you on a day-to-day -day basis. And for some people, it does have quite strong effects, which aren't always positive. So yeah, disability. The Equality Act gives you rights to reasonable adjustments. So is there something like maybe installing a lift for one person isn't reasonable, but just giving someone some rich speech software, allowing someone to work from home if it works better for them. Like these are all things that are very reasonable. Protected against discrimination, just because you can't, someone can't say, oh, you can't sit with us because you're dyslexic. Ouch, they're not allowed to do that. Harassment, you can't go around bullying people. You know, it wasn't cool in school, it's not cool now. And victimization, can you have a vendetta against someone? You can, but you're gonna get in trouble. So these are the things that the Equality Act protects us against. The next one is if an employer disputes that you have a disability, the proof falls on you. And that's important. As I always say to people, I don't give a monkey's if you've got a bit of paper that says you've got dyspraxia or not. If you resonate with it, that's good enough for me. You'll get the support. However, when it comes to the legal side, you've got to be able to prove it. Proof comes in many different ways. The easiest one is official diagnosis, and that's maybe one reason why you might look to getting one. Another one is advice from a professional or a workplace needs assessment. It's not as credible, but sometimes just building up evidence is will be just as good. As we mentioned, a disability is long-term and has substantial effects. An employer is only obliged to make an adjustment if it is known or should have been known about a disability. Uh, what do we mean by this? Say you start a job and you choose not to tell them you have a disability. Well, how can they do anything about it? Or maybe you tell them, you know what, I have dyslexia, but I don't consider it a disability. That's great for you. Not really great to say it in an employment setting because then they could argue, well, you said it wasn't a disability, so I didn't feel that I needed to follow the Equality Act. 
and it is one of those things you know it might sometimes go against your like personal beliefs of how you look at neurodiversity but you still have to know the law and follow it because that's how it currently is and lastly if an employer can genuinely not afford the adjustments fear not the government is willing to pay to a certain extent so it's on youtube just type in exceptional individuals into the google and you can watch all our videos highly recommend that one but then again i would so today as mentioned we're going to be focusing on discrimination and there's quite a few of them which i think you'll find interesting so to start off we're going to be focusing on discrimination harassment and victimization there are a few other ones but those are the key ones the different categories of disability that fall under the equality act big words sometimes you might think are they not one of the same thing but there are slight differences which can have a big impact on whether or not you want to make a claim against discrimination because i'll warn you i hope none of you ever have to do it because it is not for the light-hearted you are it's not something where you can just be like oh just someone called me a name let's sue them but it's still good to know whether or not you think it is worth your time so what are some of the types our classic discrimination the one we all know and love is direct discrimination nice and simple that person didn't like me and it did something as a result so a disabled worker and remember for this definition we are going to be calling ourselves disabled that's just how it is today a disabled worker is directly discriminated against if it because of their disability the employer treats them less favorably than they would treat others so like for instance we've got nelson here from the simpsons maybe he beats up only millhouse because he has glasses but no one else that's discrimination in the dyslexia world, maybe someone discriminates you for writing messy and they're like, just write neater and you can't help it. It's clear and cut. However, as clear as it is, it's very individual. How do you actually prove that someone discriminated against you? To be honest, unless you have like a direct recording or evidence, it's not going to be easy. But it's worth knowing. So in terms of the amount of people that file for direct, direct discrimination, it's not as high as you'd think it is. The most common one is the last one we're going to be talking about, which is due as a result of, but we'll get into that a bit more. Oh, good morning from Ohio. Lovely to have you. I went to Ohio, it was lovely. Lots of potato fields when I went. Nadia says, can you please explain what the access to work scheme is a bit more? And is this something you should apply to before you start a new role? Well, Nadia, I am actually going to be explaining more about it at the end of the presentation. But in a nutshell, it's support which the government gives you to be able to get the adjustments. So let's say I need special software and I go to my employer and they're like, you know what? I would love to help you, but money's tight. The government can support on that. And when should you apply? Now, because I'll be, I'll be truthful with you. It takes like three to four months at the moment to to, for the whole system to work they've got a massive backlog and if you need support even if you don't need it right now it's better to apply now because it is going to take a long time if you go through the government route if you go private which you're very welcome to it's a lot quicker but obviously then there's a cost but always happy to speak about that for this to count if you want to prove that someone has directly discriminated against you, you'll need a con comparator, a co cooperator. So essentially, is this someone, a colleague, that has any of these following? Do you have someone who's in the same role as you, but does not have your condition, say ADHD? Or is there someone with the same circumstances as you, but might not be in the same role, or do you have no one that this could compare to? Maybe, for instance, like if you're in your organization and someone also has dyslexia and is finding it hard, that's not going to cut it. If you've got someone who is in the exact same position as you, let's like, say an assistant or something, and they are treated differently and do not have, say, ADHD, that's a good case. Now, that is probably the most useful. However, if, you, if there's no one that applies to you, Fear not, because you can do a hypothetical person. It's not the best route by any means, 
But if you can make like a case study, like in other organizations, that's not cool. And that might be easier if you're in a smaller organization where there's less members of staff, but with bigger organizations, it should be so difficult to find someone who can directly relate to you. Like for instance, is there another manager who is being treated very similar? So the direct quote from our lovely document is, it's difficult to prove an employer intended to discriminate due to disability. An appropriate comparator, sorry, uh, will be a person who does not have the disability, a disabled person's impairment, but who has the same abilities or skills as a disabled person. So what we're looking for here, two people, same amount of intelligence, just as good at the roles as the other person, but one happens to have a protected characteristic such as autism or dyslexia, and one is being treated different to the other person. April says, at EI, many people have different roles from me, but they may also have similar circumstances to me. Exactly, April, that's a really great um, observation. It doesn't always have to be the exact job title, but as long as it's comparable. And I put an example here of uh, lovely Squidward and SpongeBob. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with SpongeBob, but you, you probably are. I always wonder, is, is Squidward being discriminated against? by Spongebob, is he harassing him? I would say, yes, Sp Squidward is a bit of a grumpy old squid. However, he's just doing his life. Spongebob, leave him alone. But we'll be getting onto a few more examples of how poor Spongebob, no, poor Squidward might be the victim and potentially could file a claim. Though he's, I want to say he's American, though he lives under the sea. So an ADHD example, here's a real world example of how it might be applied. So you have ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, and we're singled out for uh, compatibility proceedings after disappointing performance. So essentially you're a bit sloppy at your job, but results for your team, your coworkers who have similar responsibilities, but only you with ADHD have been placed on compat compatibility. So you had a team, a team project, you kind of messed it up, but the whole team did. Now, only you kind of got slapped on the wrist and told that you've done wrong. The rest of you, the rest of the others who do not have ADHD, got off scot-free. Now, that's a really thing easy to compare, because if ADHD is the only factor which makes you different from the others, then you might have a case. Tor says, when... It's the same ability slash skill. Does this include physical things like able to do stairs, walk, sit, or long periods of time? Yes, this does also apply for physical disabilities. And there is something which we'll get onto in a few moments, which relates to, you know, I'm depressed because of my autism. You know, it's still covered. Okay, now we're onto a nice gift of Rocco's Modern Life. Maybe you're old enough to realize, remember that. So indirect discrimination, this is a really great one. <laughs> um, this is when someone is discriminating against your people, you know, your community, but maybe not you directly. So this includes when an employer adopts a neutral provision criteria or practice, which puts a neurodivergent worker at a particular disadvantage. Imagine you're really sure and they, uh, they make like a seat which you can't reach, you know, they are discriminating not just against you as a person, but every other person who's a bit shorter. A saying, imagine that everyone in the team has to write on the whiteboard, because, but for you, you really struggle with writing neatly, and that causes you great embarrassment or distress. That could be, because it's a, it's a policy which is across the board, that's when it's discrimination. It's the key difference here, is if someone is asking you to do something and no one else, that's direct discrimination. If they're asking everyone to do it, but it just so happens to discriminate against, say, like a group of people like neurodivergence, that's when it's indirect. Sometimes it can be slightly easier to, uh, to prove this one. Harriet says, I've been told explicitly that my autistic traits will prevent me from being promoted past a certain position. Well, Harriet, that's discrimination. And it's not up, from, up to me to tell you what you should do or next steps, but know that that's not cool, ever.
So we'll go there. I'll give you an example of indirect discrimination, because remember, knowing what type of discrimination you may have received can help you choose whether or not to take this forward. As a little caveat to all this, you normally have about three months of being discriminated against to actually act on it. So if you're sitting on it, very, very difficult to come back and say, you discriminate against me like a year ago. It's as when it happens, do it. And I know it's tough, but genuinely historical cases, they don't do so well. So what are the three criteria that need to be met to indicate discrimination has taken place? First of all, the employer applies the same practice to all workers within the relative group. Uh, that group could be anything. You know, it could be religion, it could be sex, it could be gender reassignment, it could be sexuality. But in this instance, we're talking about neurodivergence. The next one is a practice puts neurodivergent people at a particular disadvantage. It, we're not talking about like, oh, I get a bit of a cramp holding a pen. It has to be something which is kind of singling them out due to those sort of traits. Maybe, um, you know, in another example, you know, you're all, uh, you're going, you're having a barbecue and uh, you're only serving meat that isn't halal and you've got vegetarians and like people who follow the Muslim faith. You're discriminating against them because you know they're attending. Or if you do not know they're attending, but you're still not offering provisions for everyone, well, why would they attend? And that would also count. Andrea said, I have been humiliated for dress that I wore billions of times at work before, but in a new role, and it's the same organization they humiliate for me. I'm so sorry to hear about that. And to you know, a lot of the things we say today is really gonna kick up some past experiences. We may not be able to do anything for the past because, like I said, it's very difficult to prove, like to bring up the past, but going forward. Even if you understand your rights, it might make you feel more confident in being able to stand up for yourself and to not let these things happen. But remember, what you do is up to you. I'm not advising. And the form of the, the particular practice puts people at disadvantage. The next one, the employer cannot show that the practice is proportionate means to achieving a legitimate aim. So if you say to the employer, well, you told me I wasn't allowed to use my voice software because you just, and then they were like, I don't have any reason. I just didn't want you to use it. That's not going to go well for them. However, if they say in this environment, we're not allowed to make any sound for whatever reason, and they can make a legitimate reason, then they might have a case. So remember, it all, it all comes down to the circumstances. And this is why you normally do need legal representation because it is so individual for each person. Uh, Marie says, keep a record of it all in your diary. That's a great example. You know, I hate to have to be able to prove things, but proof is, is definitely useful. So now for an, an example, Bart Simpson doesn't have autism, by the way, he has dyslexia, but I still thought it was a classic gift. An employer requires all applicants for a particular post to pass a psychometric test. So that's, you know, those tests where they try to like, oh, you know, what would you do in this scenario where they try to work out your personality and find out if you're a psychopath? And then the autistic applicant says that the test discriminates against people who are, who are on the autistic spectrum. So the employer's um, equality and diversity monitor monitoring data shows that only one self-declared autistic applicant has previously passed the test. So to break that down a bit more, there is a test and there's a certain way that they judge criteria. But when you look at the, now they're not intentionally trying to discriminate against autism. They, they have no issue with autism, but unintentionally, if you look at the data, no one with autism is passing. So obviously we've got an issue here. And that's when you could make a case of indirect because they didn't intentionally go to discriminate, but a practice they put in place has resulted in that. Oh, April, thank you. April, I thought Bart has ADD, but I think it was only mentioned in one episode. Yes, Bart doesn't have autism. He doesn't have dyslexia that we're aware of. He has ADD, fictionally. Somewhere it says he is on Ritalin. Yeah, no, it does. 
thanks for calling me out on that. But another thing to remember is that an employer can defend this. Yes, you could say, you know, whoa, you shouldn't be doing that. But the employer can rebuff that by saying it was a legitimate aim. And that's one of the key words here, legitimate aim. So this could be about health and safety. Is there something which you feel you've been discriminated against, but had that adjustment been put in place would put other people at a disadvantage? That, that trumps it. An example could be you'll tell a dyslexic person that they must write down each day like the times of when like food has been exposed or like being used. And if that person feels discriminated against because they really struggle with writing and it causes them great stress, that could be discrimination. However, if writing is the only way which is the most hygienic way or the only thing which is needed to call to cover health and safety, then that kind of trumps it. So there is, sometimes it doesn't matter either way, or it could be policies. If there's no other reasonable alternative around the problem which you have suggested, then it can't be helped. Like maybe you're in an old building, which is really old, and under the um, like certain rules about modifying the building, it would be impossible to put a lift in there. Not much you can do. Or Harriet says, another example is when employees request a driving license for non-driving jobs. Yeah, there is a need for disability awareness, neurodivergent awareness training. Absolutely, and we try to deliver as much as we can. So out of these two examples, which one do you think is in, would count, could count as indirect discrimination? The first one is, in a job application, they're asked if you have any disabilities that will make doing the job difficult. The next one is, the HR team only advertises a job internally. They only have neurotypical staff. So which one do you think would count as indirect discrimination? Okay, we've got a bit of a mixture of opinions here. So we've got two, we've got three, interesting. And you know, these questions are difficult, but there is actually a correct answer. So let's pull back the curtain. Ooh, okay, well, okay, I'll go for them. It is, in a job application, they ask if you have any disabilities that will make doing the job difficult. So this is direct discrimination. Yeah, I know, yeah, a lot is misleading. This is direct because you cannot ask someone if they have a protected characteristic. You can't do it. So you can't say, yeah, interview. <clears throat> or uh, are you gay? Yeah, you can't do that. Or, hmm. Are you Muslim? Or you can't, like you're dyslexic? It's the same thing. You can't do it. If that happens to you, you have been directly discriminated against. Now, the second one is indirect because a HR team only advertises a job internally. Internally, you know, alarm bells. Why is it so bad to offer a job only to people in your team if you know your team has the skills you need? Well, let's say the team is offering the job internally, yet they have no neurodivergent staff. You know, it's not their fault. You no, know, you might not have every characteristic of your team, but a neurodiverse person would be impossible to get that position because there's no people. The, the argument is, is quite simple. It's like, well, if there aren't any people, then we'll, we'll never change the system. Or imagine there's like a, a top CEO role or director role, and we're like, we've got no women and they're like well we've got no women we can't hire any women because there's no people on the second or the next level who are women well with that attitude you're never going to make change and you're never going to break the glass ceiling and that's when that would be called indirect discrimination nadia says speaking of driving can adjustments be made for driving tests and can you disclose your disability slash neurodiversity to your instructor and test instructor it's a good question I don't know the, the legit answer. I told my instructor that I was dyslexic and no, you can. You can get extra time on the theory test. I do not know about the practical test, but the theory test, you can get additional time. 
So this is the third one that we're going to be speaking about today. And this is the most common one which people actually use for tribunals and cases. It's discrimination arising from a disability. This might sound a lot like the first one, but it is different and different in a very important way. So I'm going to read it out and then I'll try and break it down. This is in addition to direct and indirect. The key difference is that has the disabled person been treated unfavorably because of something due to their disability? So note that no one is discriminating against someone's autism, but maybe they're discriminating against their body language and the fact that they can't make eye contact. You see, so it's like an add-on. This must be a connection between what led to the unfavorable treatment and the disability. So for instance, this guy here, maybe he's being discriminated against because he can't read, but ultimately he can't read because of his dyslexia or he finds it challenging. Also, Chantel says, they will drive point left and right, just not say turn left. Oh, okay, that's good to know. Maybe one day I'll learn to drive, but my dyspraxia makes me a terrible driver. A good example of uh, arising from a disability is say you're, you're, uh, you're Charlie Brown, you've, you've got autism, you're starting a job, and yet you, you have real bad depression and you get let, you get essentially let go because of your depression. And you say, well, that's not fair because my depression is a direct result of me having autism. So you see how they're like directly connected. And there could be loads of other things like maybe you have a service dog or maybe you need like a quiet space. If you're being discriminated against, due to a, something which you do or have related to disability, it happens. And this is a real case, by the way. So someone did get let go, I think from, yeah, from school. So any of these, do you have any of these that are connected to your neurodivergent condition? And if you're not neurodivergent, maybe skip this one or, or reply as someone that you're aware of. But for instance, do you need to take regular breaks because of your ADHD, you find it difficult to concentrate? Do with your autism, do you need to, do you struggle with public transport and you might need to go at non-peak hours? These are just some of the answers. So we've got a quiet working environment, yeah, for concentration, regular rest breaks, specialist training, I definitely need that, speech and movement difficulties. Now, these are not all the examples. This is not an, ex an extensive list. However, these all count. So if you have been discriminated against through any of these points and you have a neurodiverse condition which relates to one of these as one of the standard characteristics or traits, then and we spoke a lot about the traits in previous webinars, that would count. And honestly, from what I've read, there's far more examples of this type of um, discrimination being successful in tribunal than the others. Not a lawyer, but just from the research that I was able to do. But remember, there really is an extensive list. So those are the main ones. Now we've talked about this with discrimination, that's a separate category. Now we're moving on to harassment. Harassment and discrimination are different. Discrimination is just like an action someone may take. Harassment you're stepping the bar up, you know, you're, uh, you're taking bullying to the next level. Don't be proud of yourself though, not cool. So this is section 26. Harassment. And again, another prime example of SpongeBob harassing Squidward. SpongeBob, not cool dude, he's not enjoying it, he doesn't want pails thrown in his face. So what is harassment? Under the act, an employer engages in unwanted conduct related to a neurodivergent condition and behavior and has the purpose or effect of violating a worker's dignity. So just like this, Sponge, uh, Squidward's dig dignity is at stake. He doesn't feel cool with pedals in his face, creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, yep, that'll count as degrading, humiliating, yep, offensive, environment to the worker. So is someone doing something which makes you feel personally de-dignified, feel that someone is being hostile and making you feel insecure, humiliated? Any of these things would count as harassment. 
Helen says, very much related to the second and has happened twice in both cases, caused me to let go from my employment. Really sorry to hear about that, Helen. Creating an intimidating hostile. Sometimes, let's say you're, you have dyspraxia, people tend to be a bit more introverted because, you know, standing up for yourself when you can't communicate as fast or as consistent as others, people may take advantage of that. And that's a classic example of how it might not be the dyspraxia that they're picking on, but because of a challenge you have, they might see that as a weakness and kind of like hone in on that. So what would consider as unwanted conduct? It's a, it's a big word, but what does it mean? So on here, we've got, you select the ones that you think you would consider as unwanted conduct. Are any of these things that you would not want happening to you? And again, a lot of it, it's, it's up to the individual. Maybe spoken or written words of abuse. You know, stop calling me names. It hurts. And uh, I never, like, people are like, oh, mate, four eyes, whoa, not cool. Actually, these eyes don't work very good at all. I don't have double vision. I have, like, no vision. Facial expressions. When you're walking past, does someone go, you know, trying to mimic your face if you have, like, a tick? Jokes. Do people make jokes about, oh, how many dyslexics does it take to screw a light bulb? Pranks. Does someone do something at the expense? All of these are unwanted conduct. These are things that someone is doing to you because they get enjoyment out of it or for whatever reason, but doesn't isn't related to the role and isn't appreciated by you. Passive aggressiveness is terrible. Absolutely. Very, and passive aggressiveness is very difficult to approve, to prove, yeah. So remember, not an extensive list, but some. Here's a real world example. Well, not real world, but we'll talk. We've got Mr. Burns. He's on the phone to Smithers. He's having a great time. A manager incorrectly assumes based on a flawed stereotype. So essentially, the manager didn't do any training. They think they know what, say, dyslexia is, but they don't really know, or no dyspraxia in this instance, that the dyspraxia, dyspraxic worker cannot complete a specific task. So there's a task. Maybe it's... um. I don't know, can you, I mean, this fact is a bit more challenging, but say dyslexia. So they say, oh, we want you to do some writing, but we, we know you can't do it. You've, got, you've, you've told us you have dyslexia. I'm not even gonna ask you to do that. So that's a wrong assumption. But not only that, they then repeat that view to other workers and make patronizing comments regarding neurodivergent workers' capacity. Bringing it back to The Simpsons, because why not? If Mr. Burns um, criticised Homer Simpson for um, being slightly overweight um, and saying, oh, he can't do his job properly, that's discrimination. But then harassment is if then he starts telling Smithers, he starts telling Lenny, he starts telling Carl, and before long, he spread it. And actually, Homer can do his job just fine, regardless of any weight issues. I know that's not neurodivergence, but hopefully that's an example where you can draw close parallels. All of them have happened to me. Oh, God, so sorry, all of you. The next one we're going to be talking about, and the final one, is victimization. So victimization is different to discrimination and different to harassment. So again, discrimination is more verbal. Harassment can be more physical. And victimization tends to be for like a longer period of time, like you're a... Uh, you know, ABC or bullying, but they are all a bit different. So has someone got a vendetta against you? Is someone going out of their way to make your life miserable because they are bigot and racist and discriminating, they don't like for whatever petty reason? So a good example is, um, you know, the classic sign in the UK, what is it like, um, no dogs, no animals, no, no Irish, or there, there was something along those lines, I can't remember the exact term, but people discriminated against Irish people, and they would only let British or English people enter, or maybe you wouldn't like let Jews into a certain area. This type of discrimination has always existed, but it can also apply to neurodivergence. You have been victimized if your employer subjects you to a detriment because you have a neurodiverse condition. So a detriment is a direct action. Are they taking a direct action against you for being autistic, dyslexic? Maybe like rather than saying no ticket, no entry, no diagnosis, you know, no support or no typical way of thinking, <laughs> no socializing with your peers. You know, those words can be changed to anything. 
So which detriment, remember that is the key word here, have you experienced before? So has someone denied you for a promotion just because you have told them you will have a neurodivergent condition and they have a false assumption that you won't be able to do the job if promoted or opportunity to train? Will someone not give you the training? They think, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to train for this because, you know, you told me that. And as a result, I think you're not capable. Being subject to a disciplinary, to have someone you know, put you on probation or like for longer than you should have been just because of the extra challenges you may face, particularly if reasonable adjustments have been put in place. And lastly, your com uh, compatibility with great receiving. So is someone not giving you good work because they think you're not capable? Is someone sticking you on admin for all day when actually you know you can do the job, you're qualified to do the job, but they're limiting the work you can do? Okay, thankfully, a lot of you never. Some of you have had a lot. I think it's a mixed bag. Thankfully, it doesn't happen as severely, but, you know, be known that it does actually happen. Nadia says, sorry, Nate, please could you repeat what you meant by detriment? So in this instance, which detriment have you experienced before? So, for instance, because you, a detriment of you being dyslexic could be that you are unable to get a promotion. Or a detriment could be that you are unable to try. So they're saying, because of this, you can't have that. So you know the term be old to your detriment. It's like, unfortunately, due to your current situation, you can't do that. So it's like a limiting factor. Audrea says, yes, I have asked for additional hours, but I have been declined. Another colleague came and asked the boss for this, and she got it. That's a great example. Because they think maybe you have dyspraxia, they might not give you extra hours because they might think you might not be as productive as a non-neurodivergent employee, but yet that's not true and that's their misunderstanding. Okay, got it, brilliant. An example of victimization is you're a dyslexic worker, uh, initiate early consolidation because your employer has not made reasonable adjustments. So you're dyslexic and you've told your employer you're dyslexic and they've not made any adjustments. And you said, you know, I'm going to call you up on this and make a complaint. After the issue is resolved, they did, you know, they did with the adjustments. They gave you like the colored paper, they gave you the headphones. However, they then changed your place of work. And you're like, whoa, whoa, why have you changed my place of work? And you ask them and they say, well, you caused trouble. So they directly are doing something because they didn't like an action you've done. So again, it's not direct but it's still victimization. They're essentially going on a campaign. They're giving you less favorable treatment. They are not hiring you or not promoting you, not giving you training because you kicked up a fuss. And this is very, very severe because a lot of people do not tell their employer they have a neurodiversity. Why? Because they're, they're afraid of this exact reason. I mean, I say this is one of the most difficult ones to prove. Like a when Homer put on a load of weight, he had to work from home. He had a good time, but generally you might not always have a good time. Someone might move you to a different location and they might say something like, oh, we think you'll be happier here. But honestly, they just wanted the back of you because they didn't like the way that they were made to look bad for a failing that they did. Joe says it has happened to you. Daniel as well. Oh, sorry, all. So just to confirm, we're almost at the end, but just to really cement in all of your minds, anything I said today wasn't intended to be advice for things that you should do because it's illegal isn't my thing. But all these things have been taken from the UK Equality Act 2010, which you can all go online and all download and read. It's a bit of a mish, to be honest, and it's not the most accessible information, but hopefully you can go back from what I spoke about today and I have hopefully cited the sections on all the different areas, which could make it a lot easier to go to. But there's loads of great organizations like Citizens Advice, there's unions, um, things like that are, then, are definitely your best bet if you think I've been discriminated against and I wanna do something about it. Remember, the sooner you do it, ideally before three months, the better. And one of you mentioned, oh, it hurts, says, always get the impression that people expect you to give something back, like work extra hours. Yeah, no, that's not cool. 
like, okay, I might struggle to concentrate because my ADHD doesn't mean I should have to work extra hours. Unfortunately, a lot of us feel that way. The EHCR website is very, very, very helpful and easy to understand. No, I think it's actually not bad as well. Um, I think it depends on your needs and circumstances. A quality and human rights commission that is, yeah, check that website. ACAS gives free advice and a joint union if you can. Yes, ACAS is a good one. Is for a printable copy of today's subject? No, but we do have the recording and we can give a copy of the slides, which is possible if you think that would be useful. Oh, I'm with a union. Great to hear I know one of you mentioned about the workplace needs assessment. I mention this every webinar, so apologies if you've heard it a billion times. But if you're in the UK, you are entitled to get support. And if you, you do not even have to have a diagnosis, if you strongly resonate with some of the challenges which are associated with being neurodivergent, so do you fit the definition of being disabled? Do you have something which affects your life in a severe, in a considerable way, which you have had for longer than 12 months? That, that's normally good enough. And what happens is someone will do an assessment with you, they'll find out what works, what doesn't work. Then they'll say, I think you could really benefit from some mentoring and training. And also I think your team could benefit from having some awareness training, which is something that we're allowed to offer. We send it to the government, government says, cool, we like that. And then ideally they give you the full grant, which normally happens, but you never count the chickens. And then the training is provided and Fingers crossed, happy days. But even if you do not have happy days, it might make it easier to prove a level of discrimination in the future because you can say you have tried, you have told them, you have made them aware. You might not have the proof which is like an official assessment, but you do have this, which is better than nothing. So I always like to say is don't abuse the system, but if you think that there's a chance you may struggle in the future, it's definitely better to have the assessment before the trouble kicks in. Because let's say you're struggling and you go to Access to Work and have a workplace needs assessment. And let's say there's a delay and it might take four months before it gets through and the training and it might take five months before all the training is complete. That's five months of being miserable and depressed. So that would be my recommendation. And on this instance, because it's not related to law, I can give a recommendation. The fact that this stuff still happens so much is why we need a Quality Act to be upgraded. Absolutely, Harriet, the Equality Act is outdated and we did mention that two weeks ago. You know, you can only be discriminated against one characteristic. You can't be discriminated against two. And honestly, you can be female, gay and dyslexic and be discriminated against for all of them. But under the Equality Act, that currently is not covered. When I got a diagnosis, help me understand my behaviour and traits. Absolutely. So any questions? Okay, Helen says, I accidentally a bit sent my new employer a copy, a copy of the Equality Act. <laughs> I mean, let's see that. And got massively victimized, I guess, for this. After speaking to CA, it was obviously been discriminated. I like that. There's a bit of sass in sending that to them, but you're completely in your right. And if they discriminate, well, do something about it. I know easier said than done. Uh, really is like sometimes you've got to wear the pros and cons and even if you win do you really want to be in that company still I think it's a very personal choice Farah says I think you can only apply for an assessment of access to work when you are already in employment yes however there is a caveat to that and if you have a job confirmed you can apply to it but you have to have a job in the pipeline if you're a volunteer if you're unemployed unfortunately that particular grant is not open to you but if that is the case, then you can come to EI for free because we support people who aren't in employment completely for free. But bear in mind there is a waiting list, unfortunately. Is a workplace needs assessment the same as access to work? Yes, exactly the same. So you can have a workplace needs assessment that isn't done with access to work, but access to work is just one of them. It's the best one in the UK just because it's, fun it's half funded by the government or sometimes all but you could go private. And if you went private, that would be a workplace needs assessment, but it wouldn't be access to work. It was Fab Nat, Banks. Harriet, if you can only make claims for what has happened over the last three months, how can you build up evidence and show that you have tried to resolve it? Also, it can take years to get a diagnosis. Yeah, that is one of the issues. 
what you can do is kind of like if it's been like prolonged so for instance you can start building up evidence you can it's when like say if you it happened ages ago then stopped and then you decided to make a claim normally these things continue fortunately and i think that might be a loophole but i'm not completely sure and it can take years to get a diagnosis. A quick shortcut is having a workplace needs assessment, which is like a mini diagnosis, but not quite. But remember, even without a diagnosis, you normally are covered under the Equality Act if you believe you meet the definition of a disability. However, you kind of need to make the employer aware of it. They're not mind readers. And only in certain circumstances are they actually expected to know. Uh, like for instance, if someone's in a wheelchair, it's very obvious that they have a disability. But with something like neurodiversity, it's not so obvious, so someone might not be as aware. All I can say, be honest and open. If you're employed, if you are self-employed, you can access work fund, absolutely. But you do have to have records or income. And there's a few other little things. So it's not as straightforward, but you're absolutely eligible. The CA advised about needing to get an occupational health assessment if they know about your disability. Unfortunately, remember the proof falls on you, so you cannot make them pay for an assessment, which is unfortunate. Question, I am going to start a new full-time job next week. Would you suggest that before I start doing an individual, an individual assessment with exceptional individuals? Absolutely. The sooner you do it, the better, because it puts the support in place, it can be implemented, and also it can help you with your probation period. Because what happens is, Sometimes if someone hasn't put the adjustments in place, they can't really fail you for the probation period because it's not a fair assessment of your ability. So having a workplace needs assessment can kind of prolong the period where your um, probation is kind of valid. I don't know if shortcut's the right word, but I definitely recommend doing it sooner. However, it doesn't have to be with exceptional individuals, you know, try not to be biased, you can do it with other people, but we do specialize in neurodivergence, so not a bad idea. Daniel, for me, it's always a start. Those talks have given me a direction which makes the whole thing easier and gets the start, which for me is always my stumbling. So thanks, Nat. You're very welcome, Daniel. Oh, so many questions. Hidden disabilities. I recommend telling your employer. I think telling your employer is the best, it's the smartest thing to do, but I do appreciate how you could be concerned about that. It's not always straightforward. This is our YouTuber. So here, for instance, we've got the Equality Act 2010, we've got ADHD and pop culture, brief history of neurodiversity. Feel free to check them out. And here we are. Here's our details to get in support, get in touch, pick up the dog and bone, give us a call. Only if you're in the UK, if you're in the US, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. So drop us an email and we'll be able to get back to you. But I really hope you found that useful. And it's been a really enjoyable session to research. And I hope that you all can... Um, support each other on this do not take discrimination lying down power to the people but <laughs> generally it's been great yes but thanks guys great okay can you do a webinar on how to get employees to support you stop discrimination before you end up in the tribunal yes harriet i'm actually creating all the webinars for next year at the moment so that's a really good suggestion thanks all right, I'm going to stop there because that was a lot of talking for me and that's quite a heavy subject. But if you have any additional questions, feel free to drop me a message. And, uh, Very quickly, Nat. Yes. Uh, do you recognise that T-shirt? I was trying to show, I was trying to think what it would show, but it isn't. You're going to go, you go oh. on about uh, Simpsons. I thought it might, might be a bit fun. It's actually from the first Captain Scarlet uh, puppet series. Oh. And they all work for a company of security that's called Spectrum. So I thought I'd be in the spectrum of autism today. I like that. Thanks. <laughs> Good, decent. Okay, and all thank you for the, but yes. Oh, David knew it as well. Thank you all so much. And I look forward to it. Oh, David, good to have you here. Okay, I'm gonna go now, but have a great rest of your day and hopefully see a few of you uh, next week or any future webinars. And remember, the YouTube is always being updated with past webinars if you can't make it. Bye all.